Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Today in the church year, we celebrate Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when I got thinking about this, I began to wonder why this creation story is found on Holy Trinity Sunday. I had to do some digging around for it. Because I'm guessing that the folks who put the lectionary, the readings together, chose the first reading from Genesis because of one specific word. And you probably read this passage so often that you might have passed right over it. I know I did for the first 1,000 times I read this passage. But when I read this passage with Trinitarian eyes, I can't help but lock on on the fact that God speaks of himself in, in the first person plural. Let us make humankind in our image, God says. And this isn't a typo. It's in the original Hebrew. It's like the lectionary folks wanted to remind us that God is a tiny community and always has been right from the beginning, if God can ever be said to have a beginning. So maybe I'm reading too much into this Genesis passage, but that's what it says to me. God may be one, but we don't know exactly how God self-identifies that oneness, especially when God is a relational God. God is never alone because God can't be. That's not who God is. And since we too are created in God's image, we can't run from the fact that we also are relational creatures. We are made to engage and interact. Our very being demands that we remain connected to each other, that the path of faith and life is not a lonely walk, that we can't be who we are without each other, no matter how much we try. The phone rang one day, and I answered it, and the other person on the other line said, I'd like you to baptize my baby. Well, I'd be glad to, I replied. So what's involved, she asked. Well, I'd like to meet with you, and we can talk about how we can get your child baptized. When can you meet, I asked. Well, how's uh, Sunday at 1 o'clock, she said. Well, I said, how about you come to the church, and, and uh, we'll see, you can see what we're all about, and we'll meet in my office after worship, I suggested. Um... No, I don't think so, she responded. How about you come to my place at one o'clock? Okay, I responded. I arrived at her house armed with a hymnal marked to the baptism service, as well as a copy of uh, Baptized We Live. It's a sort of comic book version of what we believe as Lutherans. So I sat down with her and I asked the same question that I ask everyone. So I say, so, why a baptism? And I always ask this question during a baptism visit. I ask it not to jam parents into a corner, and I'm not looking for a correct answer. I ask it because I'm generally interested in what parents believe about baptism. Well, she said, I got done, my parents got done, and I should have my baby done. Well, her answer was pretty typical from what I get from parents. At least she was honest. I opened the hymnal, and I turned to the liturgy for holy baptism. And I pointed out the section where she would be making some pretty heavy-duty promises on behalf of her child. If you remember the baptism service, they, it says this. It says, as you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with these responsibilities, to live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the Word of God and the Holy Supper, teach her the Lord prayer, Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, place in her hands the Holy Scriptures, nurture her in faith and prayer, so that your child may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others in the world God made, and work for justice and peace. peace. And here's the punchline. Do you promise to help your child grow in the Christian faith and life? Well, I couldn't get through the rest of my spiel because she immediately burst out crying. What's wrong? I asked. I don't want to do any of that, she said. I don't understand. What's your concern? I don't want to force any religion on my baby. I'm not going to bring her to church because I, I want her to make her own choice when she grows up. I don't believe in church. I, I don't believe you have to go to a building to worship God, she said. And what am I doing here? I thought to myself. So I said, it's not the building that's important. It's, it's where God's people gather to worship, I replied. I don't care, she said, and she stormed out of the room. I always find it interesting that many parents see faith and spirituality as areas where they can raise their children with little or no guidance, yet still assume their children will make good choices about these things when they grow up. 
And I often wonder if she told her friends about the mean old pastor who wouldn't baptize her baby. But then I realized it wasn't me who said no to her child baptism. It was her. At an earlier point in my ministry, I would have been furious at this encounter. I would have thought to myself, how dare she? How dare she treat the sacrament of holy baptism with such cavalier consumerism, as if I'm in the religious service industry? This is God's activity in her life. It's not the Sears Portrait Studio. But after a few years into this job, I realized that she's just doing what the culture taught her to do, to define life and faith on her own terms, rather than seek the wisdom of a community who lived and breathed this stuff for thousands of years. She was making it up as she went along, dogmatically asserting the infallibility of personal choice and the inerrancy of individual spiritual preferences. She's so deeply immersed in the waters of consumerism, believing that she is swimming upstream against the religious current, that she couldn't see that most other people were floating in the same direction. And she's not as unique and radical as she probably believes herself to be. She was probably worried that I was trying to jam her into a religious box that was not of her own making, where she would gasp for air, rather than providing a doorway into a new and abundant life that God wants for her and for her child, offering her and her daughter an opportunity to participate in the world's salvation. But she was right about one thing. You don't have to go to a building to worship God. That can happen anywhere. But you can't be a Christian without others. We need the support, encouragement, fellowship, and prayers of others to grow in our faith. There cannot be any individual Christians because there is no individual God. God is a community, three in one and one in three. Don't ask me how all this works because I haven't a clue. No one really knows. But what I do know is that God is profoundly relational. We say God is with us because that's who God is. That's who God wants us to be. We can't be Christians without each other. And some say that such a perspective coming from a guy like me, doing the job that I do, is just the theological justification for keeping my job. And it's the religious rationale for propping up the religious church institution. And I won't deny that you folks coming to church helps pay my rent and puts shoes on my kids' feet. After all, a guy's got to eat and I got rent to pay. And I like my job. But there are easier ways to make money than being a pastor, and a lot more of it. But also, I've seen the church, God's people, at its best. Today, we had our faith mentoring orientation for the confirmation students. Faith mentoring is when the confirmation student chooses someone from the congregation to meet with and to talk about faith and life and how the two connect. And I have found this to be a valuable part of the confirmation process and even beyond confirmation. In August 2006, a young man in the congregation I was serving at the time was hit by a car and killed while walking home from a bar with his brother. He was the oldest of five children. The family, of course, was overwhelmed with grief. But I was surprised, and I shouldn't have been, when the former faith mentors reached out to the children, the students they had mentored, during their confirmation studies. They felt it was their duty and obligation, an extension of the covenant they made with their mentoree to support them during this awful time, to remind them of a church that weeps with them and of a God that loves them. That connection was still made. The community reached out. So when we baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we baptize into a community God's community, where we are never alone. As I thought about what that mom said and realized that at least she had the integrity to not go through with a ritual that she didn't believe in, and it could be said that she's her saying no to her child's baptism respected our church and what we believe. But still, I never say no to a baptism because God never says no. Even when parents clearly have no desire to follow through on the promises they make on behalf of their child at baptism, I still do the baptism because God does follow through on those promises at baptism. 
But our challenge as a church, as the people of God, is learning how to live our promises in a world that doesn't believe in them, in a world that tries to make up faith and spirituality as it goes along, in a world that's rightly or wrongly suspicious of formalized faith. Because our call is to remember that whether we worship God in this house of prayer and praise, or whether we worship in our own houses, gathered together, or even alone in nature, or in a trailer outside of our city, our call as God's people is to make our faith matter by coming together to remember our story, God's story, and tell that story with our lives. But whether we live up to the challenge, or if we fail in our call, God, who is Trinity, will remain faithful to us and in the world. Because that's who God is. That's what God does. And may this be so among us. Amen.